Hi everybody, I'm happy to know I have my phone muted <laughs> and right now we're going to tackle the last chapter of this semester and this is all about laws. And you know, there's a lot to consider about media law now than there were 30 years ago. So here's some things I want you to think about. Should cyberbullying be illegal? You know, I hate that word. Should the right to be forgotten exist? I'll explain what that is. Should Yelp cough up anonymous users if the users lie and damage someone's business? What if an anonymous user on Rate My Professor harms my reputation and keeps me from getting hired somewhere? Should fake news be illegal? Is it ethical for Facebook and Google to sell your data? And we're going to redo the movie ratings this time. So here's what we're doing. The right to be forgotten was actually brought up in the EU and someone in uh, a New York senator actually proposed it in 2017. Individuals be allowed to require search engines and online speakers to remove information that is, and I've made this red, inaccurate, irrelevant, inadequate, or excessive, or no longer material to current public debate or discourse. How do you define that? Isn't a lot of that subjective? And um, if you're a public figure, aren't we entitled to know everything? Or, you know, I'm really into genealogy. I wouldn't want any of my ancestors to have their, uh, you know, to have them be forgotten online because I'd like to read about them. I don't know. What do you guys think? Should this be a service that is provided? We'll talk about it. Your book talks about a free press. We have a free press. Uh, what that means is that the government doesn't control what our news does. And there's a great quote from John Milton, and I'm not exactly sure that it's always correct these days. All sorts of ideas, even false ones, should circulate, and the truth will eventually emerge. Now, in our media world, the truth might eventually emerge, but it will not get the traffic that the lie did. I think there's a quote and you'll have to double check me. I think there was a quote from Mark Twain saying that a lie will make it all the way around the world before the truth gets its shoes on. And I think that's totally true, totally true. Anyway, this is called the self-writing principle, the idea that truth will eventually emerge. It might emerge, I just don't think it's gonna get the publicity that the lie got. So we have a free press, 73% of the world's population do not, and we take it very for granted. So here's a map. If you live in a green country, you have a free press. If you live in a purple country, you don't. The government basically controls the media and the flow of information. Yellow countries are in between. I'll show you what that means. There's authoritarian, communist, libertarian, and social responsibility model of you're talking about uh, the models of expression that the news media and media in general and the government work together to provide. So authoritarian means that you do not rock the boat. Okay, those yellow countries in that map a couple slides ago, those are authoritarian authoritarian. They work with the government to maintain the status quo and the media in those countries do not rock the boat. Now, a communist model is the opposite. Communist model is when the news media is controlled by the government and if you dissent, you kind of disappear. Okay. The libertarian model means there are no, no rules whatsoever. So, like, we do not necessarily have freedom of speech according to that phrase. There are many things that we are not allowed to express. Many things that we say we do not have First Amendment protection, obscenity, child pornography, etc., etc. The libertarian model means anything goes. No restrictions on anything. The social responsibility model is what we have. It's the idea that the news should be put in context, should provide an exchange of ideas, be diverse, and be privately owned. Not owned by the government, but privately owned. So it's the idea that our news media, which is known as the fourth estate, like the, the unofficial fourth branch of government, has a responsibility to society to put news in context and talk about what's actually important, provide an exchange of ideas. So the fourth estate monitors the other three branches. But you know what? We talk about f freedom of speech, freedom of the press, but yet the government does have a bit of control over what we see in the news. For example, the government tried to ban photos of uh, dead bodies after Hurricane Katrina. They knew that it would make the government look terrible. 
CNN sued for the right to show them, and CNN did end up showing photos of dead bodies of Hurricane Katrina. But what was interesting is that the viewers and the sponsors protested, and that's what made CNN take them down. There's another form uh, of censorship that the government can do. It's called prior restraint. What that is essentially is that the government can sue to prevent something from being published before they are published. That's where the word prior comes in, prior restraint. So if you're familiar with the Pentagon Papers case, uh, if you've taken media law already, you're familiar with it. The New York Times and the Washington Post were given access to old files relating to the Vietnam War and they wanted to publish them and the government sued for prior restraint. Well, the case didn't fly because the Vietnam War was already over and it wasn't, a, it was no longer an issue of national security. So if you've seen the movie, The Post with Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks, it is about this case where um, Tom Hanks plays Ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post and Meryl Streep plays Catherine Graham, the owner, the publisher. And the whole movie is their debate about whether or not they should run this and fight the government to run these so-called Pentagon Papers that proved to be pretty boring and inconsequential, but it was a very significant prior restraint case. We're also going to talk this week about a free press versus a fair trial. All 50 states allow cameras in the courtroom, but what's interesting is that the idea that people behave differently when there's a camera around. As an American, your Sixth Amendment right is the right to a fair trial, but as a reporter, their First Amendment right means that they can cover the trial. In what way does the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment work against each other if you're trying to have a free press and a fair trial? Hmm, food for thought. So some things are not protected by the First Amendment, meaning they are illegal. Slander and libel. Slander is spoken libel is published. Here's a way to understand it a little better. Um, libel is in tangible form, either print, online, something like that, where it's, um, you can take a screenshot of it <laughs> or a copy of it. Slander is more about speaking. And that's how you remember it, slander, speaking. Okay. Libel and slander are illegal if what is reported is a lie and it damages someone professionally, okay? If you say something horrible about someone in a blog post, but it's true, they cannot, they cannot win a case against you for libel because what you've said is true, it has to be a lie. So that's where like the Yelp reviews come in, um, Rate My Professor reviews come in because those could be considered libel if it damages someone professionally and it's a lie, right? There's also a term called safe harbor that your book talks about, and that is supposed to be the part of primetime television where they show family-friendly materials. It's almost irrelevant now to date now because no one really watches television programs as they're being broadcast, and everyone's definition of what's family-friendly is different. Uh, Friends, when it was on NBC, was actually shown during the safe harbor, and that was pretty, raunchy show at times. So the 1934 Communications Act included something called the Fairness Doctrine. And what that meant is that um, if you were in the media and reporting on some issue, you had to provide equal time to both sides. It's a great idea, right? Yeah. Well, it ended in 1987. Some people want to revive it. Now, it ended in 1987, which meant that uh, conservative radio hosts could then have syndicated radio stations where they did nothing but speak their opinions and they did not have to provide counter opinions because the fairness doctrine was no longer in effect. So um, talk show hosts like Rush Limbaugh could not have really had his radio program before 1987. Okay. So there would be some limitations trying to revive this. And we'll talk about that in class. Uh, it's a great idea on paper, but I think in practice, it'd be very, very difficult to enforce. Because you think even Saturday Night Live skits, if you had a skit that made fun of a conservative candidate, well, then would you have to have a skit that made fun of a liberal candidate? You know what I mean? It was, it'd be very difficult to define and measure. 
Copyright is also not protected. And we talked about this with the music chapter. Do you remember we talked about bootlegging, piracy, and counterfeiting? But if a piece of media is in the public domain, then it's fair to use, okay? So this comes into play in almost anything, and especially if you're in media production, you wanna make sure that any music or images that you use are either in public domain or that you cover your copyright butt. <laughs> And we're also going to talk about the movie ratings this week. I think they're a scam. Um, but it, it, I'm looking at these longingly because it's been so long since any of us have actually been to a movie theater. But we'll talk about how these need to be updated and how they're not really rational and how people really don't pay attention to them. And how they also imply that everyone matures at the exact same rate. All right, so we're going to finish talking about some of the laws that other countries have relating to false information. So Singapore can find people up to a million dollars in Singapore about um, sharing anything that the government deems false. Woo. Russia, almost the same. They um, will find any Russian that posts something or spreads something regardless of fake news or shows disrespect for the state. Yikes. France did the same. Uh, wants, to over, wants to have laws to fight fake news on social media. Um, how do you even do that? How do you do that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and Germany is trying to outlaw hate speech. And a pro-Nazi ideology giving sites a 24-hour deadline to remove the content or face fines of up to 50 million euros. All right, so these countries are trying to do a noble thing, right, to spread less false information. But I feel like they're doing it in the wrong way. They're doing it punitively, right? They're going to punish people who did it. Instead, why not educate people about it? Media, have it. Media literacy is the answer here. I would much prefer that every American be media fluent than have these laws pushed on them that would never fly in our country because of the First Amendment anyway. But this is going to lead us to a pretty interesting discussion this week about what should be illegal online. And if you do say that certain things are illegal because in our country um, obscenity is illegal and pornography is of uh, people under 18 illegal. How do you even enforce that when so much of, of web content comes from outside of the United States? It's just a hairy, hairy deal, but it makes for good class discussions. So look forward to hearing from you this week and I hope you all are doing well.